Barry, do you see Sam Weisbard here is on the call? I'm looking through name. Oh, yep, I see him there. There he is. Hello. Hey. Sam. Hey, Michael Sagan. That's cool. Mr. Sagan's here. Yeah. Greetings, brother. Nice. All right. Nice. I'm, I'm feeling massively outclassed now by the, the <laughs> Autodeskers and the Henri Autodesker, Mr. Oh, Jack, because yeah. I've got Ryan Reynolds and, um, you know, it's Star Wars, it's Cars. I need to up my game, I think. You have to up your game, my friend. No question. It's just yeah. so nice of you, Michael, to bring us all together. Yeah, well, like I said, I missed the the old alias user groups. Uh, I'd like to start bringing those back again. It was, um, you know, those were fun. Maybe we can get my, Mark Sylvester to go up there with a uh, Hawaiian shirt and introduce everybody. That'd be cool. <laughs> I think I even saw Melling said that he might join. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's from the past. Yeah, exactly. We don't. We don't die. We don't go away. We just continue to. We're like cockroaches, right? Alien Late cockroaches. 19th century. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking, yeah, I'm seeing some of the names here, and I'm like, oh, there's there's quite a few familiar people there. I see some of the linkage people. I see some of the ex linkage people. I see Pierce Peterson. Hey, Pierce, how are you? Hey, Mike. Wilson. Good to see you. Uh, good to good to hear you, Wilson. Hello, Wilson. Nice to see you guys. Good turnout, Phil. Uh, they're um, they're anxious to, you know, hear the uh, the oh, Mitchie. Okay, cool. Hang tight. Sorry, guys. So we'll give it another three minutes, if you don't mind, just while everybody's just kind of getting uh, acclimated. the The session is recorded, so as soon as we're done, I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of it and uh, or gets a link to it, so you can stream it or download it, whatever you want. The cool thing is, and this is why um, this is so interesting. Once again, Linkage is hosting quarterly digital design user group. Their uh, rules are no blatant salesmanship. You know, more technical, more uh, you know what is going on in in the industry and that kind of stuff. So we constantly look at looking for new subjects to discuss. So if anybody wants to talk about what they have going on in their studio, I mean, I know it's confidential and such, but that used to be one of the cool things about the old Daily Shoes group is that every now and then somebody from one of the car studios would say, hey, here's a workflow that we really like, blah, blah, blah. And it's that sharing thing. So uh, if anybody wants to do that, that would be cool. We'll, we're always looking for subjects to put together. Once again, we'll have another session before the end of the calendar year in December. So I don't know. Uh, Phil, do you think we should do something live from AU and maybe pull it up, pull it forward a little? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. That'd be interesting. All right. Well, cool. So uh, uh, every, you know, we've got about 50 people who have joined so far. And I know that I've got some other maybes that have committed or haven't committed, but said they might be on. But anyways, we'll get going. So uh, I just want to introduce, got a top line of Autodesk people up here. Phil Botley, Barry Kimball, Michael Sagan. Am I missing anybody? Uh, maybe Jeff Smith, maybe? Jeff Smith, I see. So we really, you know, I've talked, uh, I've known these guys for a long time. I get a chance to chat with them every now and then. Uh, we helped with some beta testing for uh, Alias 2024. Barry was kind enough to come over to our our little office here in Royal Oak and spend two days with our, our people. And we kind of looked at, you know, senior person, junior person, mid-level person. What do you think? What's your feedback on workflow? It wasn't just on, you know, the new tools and such. It was, it's, a, it's a new workflow. And so I'm not going to steal thunder from these guys as far as what's going on with the software, but it's, it's a big deal, right? It's a, it's a unique in, uh, uh, release. It was delayed a little bit just to make sure that they got everything right. And I know that they're super proud of it and they've, they've done a lot of research too. They, they talk to customers all the time, you know, Hey, if you could do this, would this be better? That kind of thing. So it's not, you know, um, it's, it's a, it's a two-way discussion. 
Yeah. So if I'm going to keep track of questions. We'll save the last 10 minutes, guys, if you don't mind, for just like just questions. And if there are other questions, you know, I'm going to send the recording out to everybody who was on the session today. So if anybody wants to pose a question to Phil or Barry or Michael or Jeff um, on, you know, like, hey, I saw this, but I didn't really understand it kind of thing. Um, hopefully that's okay with you guys from Autodesk. Yeah. Cool. So anyways, there you go. So uh, Phil, Phil Botley and I have been business friends and technical friends for a long time. We worked at Ailey's together. We worked at ISOM together. We've kind of been in this world for a long time. He brings a wealth yep. of knowledge and experience in, you know, worldwide design, not just uh, the UK based, but US, Far East, travels all the time and is constantly looking to help customers on where they're going with alias and so uh the combination of him and barry and the rest of the team have put together a really nice release so i'm going to turn it over to you phil and just if you don't mind just give yeah. us uh your uh your overview yeah i mean so we're going to run it um i'm just gonna give it like a quick um you know quick couple of seconds chat then barry's gonna um do what he did at aif or annual automotive event because it was really really cool um but base but because we got so many old timers here we decided we weren't going to show 2024 we're going to show auto studio 8.5 on the o2 so barry's powered up his o2 and nice. i'm joking all right but his no, studio that's... paint as well so <laughs> you can still buy no. those on um you can still buy those on ebay you can buy you can, a, you can. You can buy an octane for 500 bucks <laughs> Actually, I'm joking aside, one of our ex-colleagues, remember Barry Hale, and Barry remembers Barry Hale. Sure. If he's watching this, um, Barry, I will pick up my O2 and Indigo 2, which are in your basement <laughs> still. <laughs> still cranking get, away, but, still running. Yeah, they are still running. All, all joking aside, though, this is um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity here, Mike, to you know to talk about Alias 2024. And what we've done, um, and 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 the, the amount of effort that we've put into it's from a development perspective and a design perspective, and you know we've been working on this for for you know many many years now, um, maybe two, uh, three odd years. It's been a real hard graft, but what we've done are some really fundamental changes to how we can actually code and um, deliver the software. We all know Alias is forty years old, so everything's kind of like a ball of wool wrapped in spaghetti with lots of sellotape around. And so if you wanted to change one command or maybe kind of a, a radio button, it would actually take a long time to do. But by separating bits of the graphical components, <laughs> the user interface, and the, and the kind of geometrical engine, for want of a better phrase, um, it allows us to do a lot of things a lot faster and code a lot faster. And it builds a great foundation for us to actually deliver more to our customers quicker and faster and be more reactive. And we're seeing that with... OEMs that we're working with now, you're going to see some exciting stuff in the next 12 months of what we're doing with a, a simplified user interface for, for, you know, for, for people who, you know, used to Photoshop, um, but only want one command to surface, right? Then a simple user and don't need to understand alias or everything. So, you know, we've been working closely with a, a, a number of OEMs in Japan to, to, to develop this. And, and that wasn't possible until we'd done this release of software by decoupling everything. Um, so this is really the, the one of the um, tangible benefits from, from doing this. It allows us to go faster, but allows us to go into directions and other areas you've never been before. Um, so it's super exciting, but this is just the beginning of the journey, right? We've got 40, 38 years behind us. We've got another 38 years in front of us um, and we're really going to actually change and continue and be true to our values, which is surfacing excellence, you know, design excellence, design ideation, great tools, funky tools, um, and, and really path lead for this. That was my sales pitch. <laughs> Normally, <laughs> there are 400 slides in my deck. I'm joking. Um, but well, I, I, and we'll obviously have Q&A at the end and we can talk about AI and all that stuff or whatever. But without further ado, over to uh, my partner in crime, Mr. Kimball, who will now show the results of the incredibly hard work our development team have done and our design team have done. And these guys, for my money, are the best in the world. Barry, over to you. Thanks, Phil. Yep. So, okay, let me just uh, share my screen out here. 
Uh, Mike, let me know when you can see it. You're good, man. We can see it. Oh, good. Cool. Okay. So, um, yeah, as Phil said, this is the uh, presentation that we did at Automotive Innovation Forum. I've gone through it a number of times. I can make this take uh, 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 15 minutes or an hour. I'll try to make it as limited as possible um, because I'd like to get to a uh, little hands-on demo that I've got uh, to show a couple of the new new tools beyond the user interface, a couple of new features that we've implemented that I that I think uh, people will really, uh, really be excited about. So um, just a little, maybe a little background and, and I'm just gonna expand a little bit on some of the things that Phil said, try to drive a few of those points home. Um, to, to let you see and, and get an inside look at what we're doing here. But, you know, just a little recap for people of, of where we were. You know, you, you've got Power Animator there, you know, version 7.5, I think, maybe 8, I can't remember. Um, some movies that I had to explain to my, my kids what these movies were, which was very frustrating. <laughs> some revolutionary things going on. And what you're going to see, like Phil said, in the next short time, we're really going to keep uh, keep pushing ahead. So, what have we been doing for 2024 specifically? Uh, brand new class leading user experience. So uh, total customization. If you thought Alias was customizable, customizable before, we've taken that up a couple of notches. Foundation for the next generation of Alias users. Okay, we've got a lot of younger people coming into the game. Um, you know, Mike, you mentioned I've known some of these people for a long time I hired in and worked for Mike in 1998 to let you know how long Mike and I have uh, worked together. He's the, uh, worked for Mike at Alias Wavefront um, back then mm -hmm. as an application engineer. Um, yeah. But we have new people that learn in different ways and use applications in different ways. And we're, we're embracing that and we're getting this user interface in a place where it's gonna be better for everyone. And what that allows us to do is set up Alias to work on a, a, a very specific ways for specific people. Now we're going to work on setting it up, but companies and people can work on setting it up for themselves. Um, I think a quick highlight. I think this should play if the sound doesn't come through. Possibly even a lift. Yeah, the video is fine, Barry, but the sound is um don't no know sound. Got... Yeah, the sound's not coming through. Okay. How far is your therapy? I'll 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 just say it was very jazzy music, and it um <laughs> it um it just shows a bunch of the new features that were going on. And it was hard for me to hear you, Mike, because I was hearing all of the audio. I'm not sure why that wasn't showing. <laughs> Must have to click something specific. Doesn't matter. No worries. Um. Okay. So overview here. You know, you can kind of see there. We've got uh, alias what we call classic in the background, um, and then the new version in the front. A couple different color themes that we've added. Now, hundreds of new features. What does this mean? We have not added hundreds of new surfacing and curve creation tools. It's not what that's about. We've added hundred, hundreds of new UI features. The good news there is that all of your surfacing tools are exactly the same. You do not have to learn how to, how to model with this new version of Alias. Square is square, works exactly the same. You may happily find that we, uh, while we were doing the user interface, we also have our customer satisfaction uh, portion of our group working on fixing bugs and adding in SUGs and doing some other things that I'll, I'll show as we uh, get rolling here. Um, switch to QML, which is the core, you know, you have Alias as a, as a application and Alias as a modeling package is built on top of another application. Right, that allows you to create the user interface, uh, and, and I think sometimes it's good for people to understand. Um, what? Why did we do this? Really, really specifically, why did we do this? And I'll, I'll I'll try to sum it up as as best I can this way. Imagine that you're a new company called Alias, 
and you hire a bunch of fresh new developers out of university, they are 25, 23, 24, 25 years old, okay? So Alias started in the mid, mid to late 80s, right? So if you think about a person that was starting to use Alias in the middle of the day, eight, middle to late 80s, and then you fast forward to 2023, and I know that some of these gentlemen were quite a bit older than me when they started doing it. And I know that I'm looking on the horizon a few, you know, 10 years out, probably going to not be in this game anymore. So we've built Alias originally on the only hardware that was good enough to run the application and have the shading and the power. And that was Silicon Graphics workstations. Those Silicon Graphics workstations had a very limited tool set for developing the user interface. So we had these young developers that came out of college, learned how to develop on a application called Edwin to build the UI. When I say the UI, what does a slider look like? What does a button look like? How does a window get moved around, right? All of these things. Well, all of those guys are getting ready to get out of the game. We have to get Alias in a position where new people coming out of college with new tools at their disposal, right? They go to the university, they learn programming languages, and one of those languages is Q QML. This is what most applications are built on, on, on top of, right? So what we've done now is we've, we're we removing the bottom. Everybody? I'm sorry? Did uh, anybody get with you on Telstar? I'm not sure about that. No, that was just some, um, somebody had not mute, muted their ah, okay. mic. So if you're okay. not speaking, just mute your mic, folks, so that. I thought it was a question. Any... No, it wasn't. Yeah, thought it, thought it, okay. So what that allows is uh, removing the bottleneck of these, of the few uh, mature developers that we have that could really, um, were the ones who knew how to program the user interface. Now we have a bunch of people who can program the user interface. It was a hard stepping stone to get to, to redo the alias user interface since it's so customizable. QML isn't that customizable. So we use a very specialized version of QML that we've custom built and coded to do all the things that people like to do in alias. It allows us to update the look and feel of alias while maintaining its familiarity. Some people like to use the right mouse button. Some people like to use the left mouse button. Some people like to use shift, right? All of these things we had to custom code while we overhauled the entire UI and made it work more friendly with uh, modern modern computer systems. Also, while we're doing it, right, you port these tools, and as you move those these tools across, you you, you know you imagine you've got thirty five, four almost forty years of people at the company, and not everyone is still here, right? So you may have had a person, a developer, come in. He built the interface in one tool one way. How he knew, he knew how to do it. Next guy builds a different tool. The arrangement of the buttons might be a little different in each tool. We took this as an opportunity to make things more consistent across the the whole application and really expand its customizability. Refreshed icons. This may seem uh, tiny, but we we've we've started the initiative to make ourselves HIG compliant, which is a human interface graphical uh, 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 set of guidelines for for commonality and making things friendly. Uh, you know, we have to have different icons for our different colored backgrounds. So all the perspectives have now been fine tuned. Um, and we've got uh, bunches of new icons that allow you to identify things real, really quickly. Workspaces and onboarding. We're looking to move towards a role-based approach. So, you know, currently you might think, oh yeah, you've got alias and you've got concept surface and auto studio. And we could say, you know, designers use concept and uh, class A people use Surface and a person who does a little bit of everything uh, uses Auto Studio. Well, we see that we can target a bunch of people across the studio. And with the new way that Alias is, is user interface, what it allows is us to take the user interface and, you know, moving forward, maybe you have a person like a studio engineer, right? They're not typically an Alias user. They get the files from an alias user, put them up to engineering, and they're typically an engineering CAD package user. But what if they want to work directly in alias? A lot of what we hear is that alias, too many buttons, too many things. Well, we can take the user interface and customize it to the point where if, if we knew what a studio engineer wanted to do, 
was open a file, cut a cross section, and print it. We could make the user interface say file open. The next button wouldn't be edit. It could say cut cross section. And the next button could say print because we can now customize the user interface to that level. We, we can even not allow him to save. I mean, sometimes that might be handy because you don't want people saving, saving over things. So we think we can target each of these uh, individuals and expand the base of people's access to the information that's available in alias, right? A lot more people can get use out of the information that's available in an alias model versus just the designer or just the modeler, right? We can expand that and have many people getting, getting access to the information. And that's, that's really what it's about, getting access to the information. Alias is a communication tool, right? So here we show a little bit about you know, how different personas might have the interface customized. So in this case, a class A surface person, he's got his tool shelf and control panel on the right-hand side, diagnostic shading, palette on the one side. He can embed his object lister and, and reference manager so he can get access to his things. Next person can come along. Maybe they're a CAS modeler. CAS modeler, if you're not familiar, typically it's a term used in, in Europe but it's a concept surface person, right? So they, they're not class A, they can throw a nice model together. Maybe they tune themselves a little bit more towards the, the shading and the, in, in the artistic side a little bit. They can customize the user interface. You can see a new material editor here and a, and a bunch of good things like that. Um, next, maybe we have a designer. Now what we've done uh, uh, in, this, in this context is that we've overhauled how let's just say how images are used inside the application, whether they were uh, uh, image planes or canvases or the painting utilities. We've gone through and, and done an overall on that. Hey, Barry. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but while you're on the topic of the um, the shader um, engine that Alias uses, um, I had a question. Um, did that, I mean, not only the user interface, but did the shader engine get an overhaul too to make it a lot more user friendly um to, to apply like kind of like a little more like you know like um unreal engine or or like key shot or anything like that ha, ha, did that get an over or or is it just the ui yeah so so the time the time frame that we had to build this application it was ui only we didn't have time to overhaul uh the the rendering engine at the same time that's a future project that we're currently uh, engaged in. Okay. I, I, I'm okay. sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just... No reason to be sorry. It's a good okay. question. Um, okay. Thank you. okay. Yep. The, the shader editor and, and, and actually the way you apply shaders and th some things um, have, has been modified and some additions have been made. I would say it works more like Vred as, as the drag and drop approach that Vred uses. Okay. You can now do that in Alias. But the materials and the shaders themselves, they're the same shaders and materials that you've always had in Alias. No oh, change to that. Yep. I see. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, you bet. Good question. Um, our onboarding, um, lots of new, okay, if you get your hands on the application, um, don't just brush past this. A lot of effort has gone into movies, and guided tours on how you customize the new user interface. So if you find yourself, you know, maybe you're a father and you open up kids toys and you just start assembling and you get to step 18 and you realized, wow, I didn't even follow the steps and I missed steps two and four and I can't get to those screws now. You might wanna watch this onboarding set of videos because it's really gonna let you know some tools have been moved into some other places. Okay, so I, I'd suggest give these a look, give them a, give them time, and uh, th they'll really help you with with some of the new features and things that we've done in the application. A lot of time spent on the onboarding stuff. This helps new users especially too. Okay, so what have we done with with some of the major components of Alias? Um, the one thing that we did in, in is 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 went away from. Uh, the the giant paint package that Alias had, because statistics showed us that not many people were using the paint package in Alias. We had very, very few people using that. And we would have had to port every single tool inside of 
the paint package. So we chose to take a more targeted approach for the for this release. And we've separated markups from canvases. Previously, they were mixed together, right? So if you wanted to do a uh, some drawing over top to give someone direction over of something, you'd just be making a canvas. But if you brought an image in and you wanted to model over that, it was also a canvas. And then we had layers and you know, it's interesting approach. It's just what we did. It's what we had at our disposal back when it was implemented. But you would bring a canvas image in to draw over. And if you wanted to go turn the images on and off and look at them in the canvas lister, they weren't an image, it was the name. It's a novel approach to make them the actual image so it's much easier to identify and see quickly and click them on and off. So what we've done is we've made markups, markups. Markup means I'm drawing over something on the screen to give someone direction. Then we have canvases. A canvas means it's an image I'm pulling up in the background to model over top of, okay? So clear delineation between these two things. You can still bring it, you know, you can still bring in other um, images from other applications. All that still works. It just, they just come in as canvases, okay? Animation. So what we've done, Alias had a full set of animation tools, right? You could make movies in it. It's where the background came from, Power Animator. Once again, there's a pretty fantastic product that most movies are made on top of, and it's called Maya, and it's got some pretty sophisticated animation tools. I would say that's your tool of choice if you're gonna be doing sophisticated animations. What we've done in Alias, we've brought the entire engine over. So if you have animations already done, like I have a mannequin that's rigged, I can bring that into 2024 and modify it and the rig works. The engine is under the hood. What we didn't do is bring the entire user interface across, including all the IK animations, cluster animations, and all of those things. We did not bring the user interface to those. So you cannot recreate those things in 2024. What we did do was made it much easier to do key point animations, keyframe animations, pardon me. So you wanna make doors open and close. You wanna mix animations together. These things that we've gone, we've gone through these things and modernized them and made them much easier. And this just gives you a look at a, at a user interface where maybe you've got your, your shader library here. You can see how that looks different. Your shader editor here is different. Got a pretty sophisticated object lister with a lot of buttons and whistles, your, your time slider along the bottom canvas lister over on the right. Okay. Uh, modeling tools. You know what? I'm just going to skip that one because uh, I'm going to go over those um, myself. Learning edition updates. Uh, there's now a uh, uh, learning edition for alias, free to download. Anybody don't need an education uh, uh, login or anything. You just have to go get an a, uh, Autodesk Login, and then you can download and use uh, the alias learning edition uh, whenever you want. So just a quick summary, uh, brand new class leading user experience. We believe it's the foundation for future users of alias and existing users. And it's going to offer some possibilities that we couldn't really have before with the customization of workspaces, which I'll show. Um, and this is just a start, um, as Phil said. Big thank you to our development team. This is a lot of this is a lot of underhood work, right? This isn't do, taking a clay bar and perfecting the paint on your car. This is going underneath and changing the brakes and 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 the oil and all of the things that aren't so fun to do with the car, but are really necessary if you want that car to last. And that's where we're looking to go. So, developers, they didn't get an opportunity to work on a lot of the fun things that they really enjoy working on. This was a lot of painstaking work. So like Phil said, uh, big shout out to them for uh, for this this version of the product. So Barry, one thing about that I wanted to ask you and kind yes, of sir. just um, clarify, it looks like a lot of the foundation, if you use the house metaphor, you know, you went back in and you jacked the house up and you put in a new foundation and you fixed some things along the way. Will it make it easier in future to add more things or faster or more efficient to add more things now that you've enhanced it or built yeah, that foundation? Yeah. Yes, 100%, because the the, the application is now, um, what, what's a, a good way to, to envision it is things are componentized now. Mm -hmm. So 
so as soon as one person builds some aspect of an interface, some slider or some uh, uh, something in the GUI, something in the interface, like a, a, a dot that you can drag on an edge, that now can be grabbed out of the code and pasted into other areas. So it makes it, makes it quicker to build new tools and new features. And the other thing that it, that it does, it allows our XD group. So, you know, we have developers and then we have different levels of developers. Some are, you know, core mathematicians that write things like the surface fillet code and multi-surface tools. Other guys are really good at sub D modeling tools, but all these guys can now also program the UI that they couldn't do before. But we also have an XD group and what the XD group, they're mm. the experienced designers, right? They, they design, you know, they mock up in, in a visual application what the interface should look like. But what QT has allowed those people to do is actually write the code for it and give the code for what the UI should look like to the developer. So that just expands our number of developers and the available resources that we have, right, Mike? Like, it's all about the number of resources that you have and how efficient can they be, right? So okay. our bottleneck was programming the user interface, and this this just puts an end to that. Right. I understand. It, it's right. a lot more customizable. So Good it's a hear. great question, and it yeah, and yeah. It, it it honestly allows us to be way faster than we were before, and put more tools in, and make more modifications. The other thing, when it's componentized, you can change the aspect of something across the application versus having to go into each individual tool and change it, which is where we're at in previous uh, builds of the software. So and just but, just, to, just to double down on that point, Mike. You know, as Barry says, you know, we're not doing it per component now. It's kind of like a library. We change one thing, it propagates. And you know, we've got a great example of something we've just, you know, we've just implemented um, for our upcoming release for a particular customer, which is a, a customizable hotspot. Um, part of this work we're doing on a, a user interface for designers. Um, and before that could have taken a long time because as Barry says, we'd have to create specification, give it to some of our developers to code it and go back and forth. Whereas now our design team are completely empowered to actually mm. plug this straight in. So within the week, we had it under an environment variable being tested uh, by this particular customer, um, unprecedented in terms of mm. the speed which, which we can now not only design, but code but actually get out to our customers to get feedback to iterate. And we're talking about maybe taking 18 to 24 months worth of traditional work and collapsing it down maybe into a quarter. Nice. Good yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Top notch. Um, okay. So, uh, so Mike, yeah, if you could watch the, um, I can't watch the comments and things while we're, while I'm doing this here. Um, otherwise I would take up some of my screens. So if people have questions while I'm doing this part, I'm totally free to you be in the interactive section if session if um, people have questions. We'll um we'll try to carve out the last ten minutes, Barry, for sure. Q and A. Let me so. get an eye. Okay, so we got a half hour. Good. Um, <laughs> I gotta be. A, I gotta be a little. No, we got uh, twenty minutes. Okay, so I gotta be a little speedy. So I mean, this is the application. Um, for the most part, people look at it and go, well, "Wait, what's the difference?" <laughs> it's it looks a lot like Alias. Um. And I'll kind of I'll, I'll kind of show you that uh, I guess as we go here, um, same hotkeys or you know same clutch keys. Alt Shift Control are doing all their normal things, and you've got under your preferences your clutch key editor. So you know you want to edit your clutch keys, you can edit your clutch keys. Fine, fine to do that. All those those controls are available. Let me just look here and be sure. Okay, yep, I thought for a second I might be using a brand new build of the software and we don't wanna let any new features out of the bag quite yet. Um, okay, so this is the user interface that 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 I have built for myself. Um, maybe I'd like to show you how, how you get there. Um, one thing we have, Alias has always had workspace, not always. For a decade, Alias has had workspaces. Most people never chose to use them. They were a bit clumsy. There was a good idea. I think the implement implementation didn't pan out as we thought it would. I believe that what we've done now with workspaces and preferences, people are going to find 
very attractive. And, I, and I'll show you what I mean here. So previously preferences and alias were a folder with folders inside that folder and a bunch of schema files. Now your preferences are one file. So that allows a few things. One is a JSON file. You, so you could edit it using a text editor. And if you're savvy enough, which a lot of younger people are today these days, from their gaming growing up, they figured out how to do some coding, something that I'm just not adept at, even though I had a Commodore 64. Um, you can do some really crazy things just using text editing, all of which can be done graphically inside the U UI. Down here on the bottom left-hand corner are different preferences. So what you'll have by default is a guest profile and a user profile. If I click on guest profile, it says, hey, you've got your preferences up. Do you want to save those? I'm just going to say no. It brings me over here. And this is default. Okay. So I, I, can I get rid of this? This sharing thing? It's irritating. It, it's oh, Sorry, it's just over top of my UI. I'll just have to store it there. Um, so it gives you these different... Um, options across the bottom. So these are workspaces, right? So I have a default workspace. I can click here and go to a subdivision modeling workspace. What does that do? It allows me to have a totally different user interface for each different type of modeling or work I'm going to do. So in this case, it switched out my marking menus. It changed the size and scale of this, and it added a toolbar across the top. I could go to visualize. That switches the interface out. I can have shaders over it, my materials over here, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So how do, how do you get this stuff set up? That's what I'd like to like to talk about a little bit next. So I'm just going to go to the user profile, which really, what is the user profile? That's kind of um, yours to modify. Okay. So I'm just going to undock these things for now and, and show you show you the new docking functionality and how, how some of this stuff um, builds, builds on itself. So I've got my diagnostic shading panel here. Um, as I, as I just, I'm just using my left mouse button to resize this window, nothing to see here, nothing fancy. But as you can see, the icons stock, uh, uh, dock and, and move themselves around, okay? Now, what I could do is take the control panel, something you could never do, I mean, you couldn't really modify the width of the control panel before. Now you can modify the width of the control panel. That was impossible before. The other thing you can do, middle mouse button. Middle mouse button, and as I drag two windows over top of each other, you'll see blue edges and borders appearing. So I see one along the left-hand edge. If I let go, it's going to dock it. Now those two windows are embedded together. Now that's something that you could sort of do in previous versions of Alias. Middle mouse button, and I can tear that off. I can also middle mouse button, drag it over top right here. I get that little folder, the little blue folder icon. And if I release right there, now I've got them on top of one another, okay? So how do I use that? Well, what I do is I go over here and I'm, I'm gonna put my control panel over here. All right, so I've got that and I wanna get that. I like it four icons wide. Then I'm gonna get my diagnostic shading over here. I'm gonna bring it towards the bottom and I want it to dock right there. Okay. And then I want to bring, I've got a shelf, you know, we don't ship the software anymore with your standard four buttons across the bottom that are CV move, cross sections, yada, yada, yada. I'm going to take this, I just named this control panel shelf. Um, if it only has icons on the first row, you don't get a tab. If you make, if you make just a new shelf, um, so if I was to go here, shelves, and say um, new shelf, you say yes. Now I've got a shelf here. Gives you these kind of fancy guided tour icons. Hey, you want to put some tools in here? Go over here. Just drag them in there. Drop them. And they'll they'll pop up in this tab right here, right? So little little kind of shelves or little kind of menus that show you what you could do with a certain feature. And you'll, you'll see those appear all over the place. So if I take something like the reference manager and I don't know what it does, it says, oh, there's no reference files to display. 
click here to import a reference file. You click there, now you got a reference file, right? So a little guided tour, something that we didn't have things like that before in Alias. Um, so this shelf, I want this shelf to appear right in between those two. So now you can see the way it shows, it's like, it's a control panel shelf. It's got a tab and then it's got two icons. And this is how, let me just give you a little insight on how to some of this development happens. So I see this and I go, I say to the UX guy, I said, yeah, I'm aware it's a control panel shelf. The reason I'm aware it's a control panel shelf is because I made it and I called it control panel shelf because I wanted to put it in the control panel. I don't need it to tell me there's a tab. It takes up too much room. Okay, so they went through a little bit of iteration. And in the end, what now this was all programmed by a UX person, not a C programmer. So now, as I sneak up on this, you'll see that there the tab disappears. And if I sneak up on it even more, then the title bar disappears, right? So that took a negotiation to get it to that point before release. But what it allows us to do is have things like this curvature tab open. And now I just get a lot more room in my shelf here. And I'll, I'll keep expanding on, on this, this customization here. A couple of other things. Um, something you could never do in Alias before. I got to watch the time. 40, we got 10. Um, something people might like. I know myself, it was a must have. Um, the text is different in Alias. Okay, it's anti-aliased right now. It's softened a little bit. If you look, if you go after this, you know, after this call, if you jump back on your, your computer or whatever, and you you look at the font in alias, it's a little jaggedy. It's not anti-aliased. It doesn't look maybe this saucy, I guess. And here's something that you couldn't do in previous version of alias. Default text size is 11. I need glasses, but I'm too lazy to go get them, even though we have great uh, glass uh, eyewear coverage. Um, I can change the font size interactively. You, well, I can't say it wasn't done before. There was an environment variable that maybe two or three people know in the world, I guess. Um, but what it what a it, this just allows you to go ahead and and make it like you know grandma's phone or uh, something a little more. Um, um, palatable if your vision isn't so good, or if you're on a 4K monitor, right? All the interface scaling and all the interface drawing is done using Windows, FYI. So if you're if you're looking at scaling, what you're going to want to do is do an interface scale for the application of about 200% if you're on a 4K monitor. That'll get you about the same looking icons as classic alias. If you don't do your interface scaling, it's going to use 4K, Windows is controlling that and your icons and text will be small because it's 4K resolution and Windows is in control. Okay, so just use your interface scaling in the Windows side and bump it up to 200% and you'll get something that looks really pretty close to um, to what, what, what you have in Classic. You can also do the padding here. So I just like to set mine pretty low, keep it nice and compact. I like as big a modeling area um, as I can get. Um, Okay, so you've got your same layers and things across the top. Most of that stuff is, is pretty much identical. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch over now to my UI. Um, and really the only difference in mine and what I did, I like my palette across the top. I've got a shelf over here that I use. Now you're free to open this and click icons. I'm a right mouse button, drag, and then release with the shift key on a tool. That works. Um, I'm also a right mouse button, drag. But what you can do now, just like you could in Classic, I can right mouse button and release, cascade a window, right mouse button, and get the user interface to open. As you can see here, square looks identical. Okay, It's the same code. Might have a bug fix in here or there, but it's the same code. Okay, square is going to work as square. Subdivision modeling is going to work just like subdivision modeling did before. All that stuff is the same. A couple of things you might notice. Some different tabs, some different menu drop downs across the top. Um, we have a visualization tab now, right, versus object display. So we've, uh, you know, kind of put all the visual visualization things underneath the visualization tab. So you've got your diagnostic shading. 
your hardware shading and your different editors for that. Even your camera editor is under here. So if you go to view and you want to see the camera editor, nope. You want to go under windows and find editors, camera, nope. It's under, it's under visualization. Display, it's got a bunch of your display controls just like it did before. Um, it, I'll just say this. If you're, and this was a discussion that was kind of fun to have as we were building this user interface. And, and just one day I said, you know, Windows appears to be where you guys put things that you didn't know what to do with. So if you're in the UI and you're, you're looking for a tool that you think should be in the upper menu, but you just can't sort it and find it. One, we have a brand new tool locator, which this thing's way more sophisticated than it used to be before. It works quite well. But if you're looking for a tool that should be in the menu, but you can't find it, I suggest my tip would be to go to Windows and give that a look. If you look down here, some people, I'll be honest with you, 35 years, I've never used the SPD window. Some people live and die by it. So SPD window has been ported and brought across for those of you that want to do that. Got your stages and your stage editor. Looks a little bit different. Works the same. You can, you can open multiple windows or open multiple files, works the same. Uh, Alt key on a bunch of things, works the same, really good. Um, click your uh, move CV tool here, transform CV tool. Got a new uh, option box that pops up. Same tool set, just reordered just a little bit differently. I think it's, it's better UI wise. Um, and then what I've done at the bottom is I've got these different workspaces. So I've got my surfacing workspace, then I've got my subdivision modeling workspace. Looks a lot the same. Really what's different is my marking menus because I have edge and edge loop and face loop, things that I wouldn't typically do when I'm doing my NURBS modeling. Um, and and I, I use the same kind of tool set over here because I, I tend to use the palette for everything because I don't know, based on experience, I know where all the tools are in the palette. Um, and then I've got a visualize tab that, that I, that I built, which, so I'm modeling and now I get somewhere and I hit my hardware shade and I, I have something that was accidentally the wrong color, maybe, or wrong material. I can just quickly click, click on, click on this, assign a couple of materials. And someone, someone did mention, um, if there was any material changes, I guess I'll just point out that, you know, we have a, a, a black material here. So I don't know what one that is, but. This is where we get some consistency, maybe, or 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 I could show you um, how we've tried to make visual uh, visual items in the interface reappear when you do similar tasks. So if I pick on this material, I have two little icons. And if you hover, see that one says assigned to object. It's an arrow with a box. This one says pick. You know, previously, Alias was very unique the only software I've ever seen with drop up menus. And if you think about the multi-lister in classic 2023 and previous, legacy from version five, when all of alias was drop up from the bottom, that one was never rebuilt. So the, the, the shader lister and environment lister and the light lister were all drop up functions. I've never seen this in an application before, but, um, that's all been rewritten, so it's not a drop up, but you can now do with something like you just click this and it will pick all the stuff that's associated. So I can pick this, I can pick this. You can also pick a surface like so. Come over here. This is a filter. Okay, it's the it looks like a little, you know, little filter. Click on that and I can say picked objects. Now it shows me there's that has obviously a layered, a layered shader. Click on here and we can do a pick. It picks all of those, right? Go back here and say, show me all. Okay, another thing that I can do, if I wanted that to be blue, maybe, if I drag and drop, this wasn't possible before, if I drag and drop with my left mouse button and I let go, it's gonna apply it to a single object. That's how red works, by the way. If I middle mouse button and I drag and drop, it's going to replace everything that had that material with that material that I just dropped. So you have left mouse button, does one entity, middle mouse button, swaps everything. Notice it didn't get this one because it wasn't assigned. Then I can just drag and drop that one, okay? So these little icons here. Um, 
I'm a layer bar user typically. I'm not necessarily an object lister user, and that's just based on using alias too long where we didn't have an object lister. Um, a lot of activity, maybe I wanted to pick this back wing. Typically an alias user would right mouse button or left mouse button and say pick. Okay. Now, now if you just come up here and click it with the left mouse button, I get these options that quickly appear. This is this is assign and this is pick. So I don't even have to look at this drop down. I just go pick, pick, and I've got that selected. If I have some objects like this and I want them to be on that layer, pick assign. And now they're on that layer. So the the the, the thing I'm I'm trying to illustrate there is that that icon and that icon will do the exact same thing everywhere in this interface. Okay. Okay, shoot. We wanted to leave. Can I use four more minutes, Mike? Silence lets me think I can. Uh, is it sorry, is it Barry? Yeah, oh, so you have to yeah. read in the question. So yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, you know, we, we could about... take some. We could take some questions. That, that's okay. all right. All right. While yeah. we're doing that, that's actually kind of a good segue in a couple of these things, and I think shaders was a kind of a big question, and um, you know, with Autodesk owning so many different software tools, right? You talked about Maya, you got Studio Max, you got Softimize, you've got Alias, you've got VRED. Is there any thought of consolidating the shader libraries or coming up with just one standard shader library kind of thing? Bill, you want you want to take that one or you want me to take that one? I I I well, I can take it. Um sure. <laughs> if you want me to. Yes, the, the answer is yes, Mike. So we are we are looking at that in terms okay. of consolidating the shaders. So we have a number of projects, as Barry alluded to, from the alias and VED perspective, um, which, which really means that we will have consistency of shaders across the applications. Okay, so and mm. the rendering will also uh, be, begin to begin to change. We 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 are, we are sort of on the the red side. We're separating the red rendering engine, um, Vulkan based, and putting it inside of alias. Okay, so that means we'll have the same shaders. We won't have to approximate. And so what looks the same in Alice will look the same in is red. So that, that's one answer. The other answer, of course, is how we're standardizing these materials. And, 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 and that's not just in our team, um, but also in the wider Autodesk system and also the wider eco, the wider ecosystem with yeah. some of the stuff we're doing with Adobe and, and those guys. So the answer about PBR is yes, we're very much on that track to have a standard um, shading model um, that, that can be read and could be used you know, Material X, MDL, Substance, they'll all be supported. Um, but PBR is certainly something where we're looking to um, to standardize on that. So we have continuity, Maya, Alias, Red, Fusion, products outside our ecosystem as well. You know, we can have the same material and we can reuse it. Uh, we can use okay. it and we can propagate it everywhere. Good. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Another question we had was on the modeling side, uh, someone asked, so they didn't see a lot of new tools. And I think Barry, you explained that at the beginning. Oh, but then, was... well, let, let, let me just, they said, this is a good question, uh, Mike. <laughs> Barry is about to show one of the best tools, yeah. right? Got it. Kick, kick, cool. Kicks ass, feature yeah. modifier. Go yeah. Barry. Um, Go. So, okay, maybe I'll skip, well, in the sake of time, I have to show at least how it works so people can go back and... and I'm sure and Mike can let us know, a, can't you, Mike? Have a go at it. I can give you an extra five minutes. Uh, okay. Fantastic. Thank okay. You. So, so feature modifier. What this allows you to do is basically take a set of data and based on the U and V structure of, of, of two different surfaces, modify that data. We have this in other tools like the conform rig. The key here is that this tool now, first tool in Alias, that has a topology engine. It knows what edges of what surfaces go to other edges. I don't want to say I'm the guarantee fairy, but I've got quite a bit of experience in demos that show this will hold continuity to 0 0.001 um, position and 0 0.1 tangency. And here's here's how it here's here's what it does. So I grab some data. I hit the space bar. That's what I want to modify. I want to go from this surface's shape, space bar, to this surface. And it modifies it. 
Okay. Now, if that was a badge and I wanted it to be the same in the front view, if we look at these options over here, I can say, hey, you know what? Instead of modifying it in normal, what is this thing doing? Imagine that there was a volume around, around this data based on this plane, and that volume gets distorted to this arc-shaped volume, right? With a normal stretching. Well, I wanna tell it, don't change in Y. So now if we look at this guy here, it's it's um it's gonna look the same even when I put it on a different shape. So I put this maybe on my front front grill or fascia. It looks my badge looks the same in the front view, so I'm not changing the 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 fundamental aspects of the badge. But what I am doing is changing its shape and what it fits on. Okay. Now we could also say grab this stuff and go from this surface to this surface. Oop, oops. Grab this stuff, grab this stuff, spacebar, go from here to here. Distorts it like that. But then I could also box select those, so it goes on those. And just to give you an idea, what, is, what, what do I mean by U and V? If we look at where this is, it's in this box. It's in the UV of this area. And if we look over here, it's in the UV space of that area. Okay, so that's fundamentally how, to, how it works. But then if you want to see something quite interesting, this is how fast it is. So if I if I take that and move it, it follows it. If I take these CVs and move them, it follows it, right? Very, very fast because we're working on a very structured thing called the UV space. So if we go to, let's just look at something that's a little more um, maybe a little more satisfying. <laughs> so, um, this, uh, this pattern, right? Got a pretty complex pattern. Um, if we shade this up, it kind of, I don't know if it's stepping up, if it's stepping down, and it wants to be on a distorted surface. Okay, so it wants to have it wants to have plan view shape. But I can't possibly create that pattern in a in a plan view varying shape. It's too difficult. So I make that pattern in flat space. There's my target surface and there is my source surface. So I have constructed a from and to surface that have the same CV structure, okay? Then what I can do, so all of these, my story for this is quite, is a lot better, but for sake of time, I'm just gonna run you through it. These are all Bezier surfaces, all built to 0 0.001. So I can take feature modifier, I can grab these 4,033 surfaces, spacebar, click this one. It's gonna pause for a second. Right now it's calculating all the topology. Okay. Forgot, I gotta have that on normal. Spacebar, and I pick this. Now it's modifying 4,000 surfaces. This is on a laptop, okay? It just did it. I picked these. Can't do the whole thing for sake of time. Evaluate. Check for tangency. You're good. Zoom in. All still Bezier. That right there. And, and then and then if that's not, you know, if that's not entertaining enough. I just, I, I uh, my friend, um, my colleague James here said, well, that's just a pretty simple thing. What if we put it, you know, what if, what if we put it on this, this twisted surface? Okay. And I said, oh, okay, let's try it. So we've got, we've got that guy. So now we say, let's go to feature modifier. Let's grab all this stuff. 
not my source surface. Grab that guy, space bar, and have it send it over here. Hey, Barry. Yeah. Real quick. Um, I'm, when I'm in Grasshopper, I'm just curious. Um, I'm I'm doing what you're doing, but I'm doing that over 10, 12, 13 surfaces all together that have continuity. Because when we get handed data, no one, I mean, it's nice to have that in, in, a, in a textbook setting. But a lot of times when you're given um, final class A surface and that sort of thing, we have multiple surfaces we're dealing with that head in different directions. Can this tool handle that at all? Or is this just basically confined to the just the four-sided type um, application? So currently this tool works, well, currently this tool works on, on UV space in this version. I would say that I would, I would look to a future release of Alias to have it work across multiple surfaces. Okay, that would be amazing. I'd be- Yeah, now, now not to be misleading, it won't, this tool works fundamentally on the UV structure of surfaces. So if you have 27 surfaces that this is going across with all kinds of different UV space, um, trimmed, not trimmed, yeah. uh, uh, angles in between them and things like that, even a future iteration of this won't work because it's still working based on, on UV space. But there are, uh, in, the in the Dynamo Player Kit, there's multiple tools that work across multiple surfaces. Mm, okay. Built into Dynamo Player, which is our our product. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, in, in that space. Yeah. Okay, guys. So um, okay. thank you. Uh, there were some questions on on marking menus that Phil addressed. Uh, Pierce and Sean had some questions on marking menus I, uh, that were addressed, like um, just making marking menus a bit more functional. I mean, I know that they're fantastic now and no question but is there uh can you guys fill or very quick highlights on enhancements to marking menus in this release and then what's planned for next if you can talk about that well i mean and so this is the new marking menu editor um so it's quite a bit different uh marking menus do work the same um and phil can expand on a customizable uh menu set uh Basically, it's it's going to be somewhat similar to. Imagine you can custom build one of these, right? Mm -hmm. Custom build a custom build something that when you activate some clutch key, you put the tools that you want on that clutch key, right? So it's like it's not really a marking menu, because marking menus are typically reserved for not modeling tasks. Some people use them for it, but typically you have selection things, transformation things. And then typically visual and maybe some organizational things. That's what most people use. But the the enhancements to a, a kind of a, I don't know what we even call that. So like a tool, a, a hotspot is what Maya calls it, but a customizable yeah. um, palette that you can just pull up when you want. Mm. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a customizable hotspot, hot spot, you know, the space bar, whether it be the painting tools or the stuff in Maya. But as Barry says, the key thing is it's... Um, it, 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 it kind of has some notion of intelligence. It knows which commands you're in. It's customizable. But critically, from a marking menu perspective, we're now we're now investigating secondary and tertiary marking menus. So it cascades out. Um, that coupled with some ideas looking around macros, um, you know, really kind of supercharges and turbocharges the not just the marking menus but the hotspots. That combined with the user interface allows us to have this concept for just having one single hotspot. For a modeling tool for a for a particular user, so you don't need to have eight hundred ninety eight tools um, in Alias anymore. You just have five, um, and so you can begin to model, which is probably not good for us because we've been using it for thirty odd years. And you know, I'm a layer bar person like Barry, and not a big fan of object lister. Um, but um, but but you know, for for the for the for, for the young the young kids, you know. Boom, open it, it's there, single menu, easy to use. And, and, and again, some, some of the questions on here, right? What we've also done is Barry pointed out the onboarding screen is really important. You know, Randall and the guys done a fantastic amount of work there because that can propagate everywhere. So some things that we that we haven't talked about, right? We've we've got localization built into it. 
So, you know, if you're in China, if you're in Japan, um, it, it will expand this. The tool, not just the tool tips, but the tool tips and the help menus are localized, right, to your language. Fantastic. But also what we can do now is we can bake in videos into this. So say we release a brand new command. Say we've got, you know, the feature modifier. And, and nobody uses it because everyone's doing their job, right? We don't have time to use it. So when you start alias and you go, oh, there's a new tool, the menu pops up and says, hey, Barry, here's feature modifier. This is what this is what it does. It does this, it does this, and it can guide you. And this is also important because as we explore not just artificial intelligence, but making tools easier to use, alias will begin to help guide users and say, actually, this is the next step or mm. kind of pre-select where you click next. If you're not an expert user, where you, where you should do the fillets or the tools. And this is what this, this kind of new user interface architecture allows us to do. It allows yeah. us to actually really do these really cool things yeah. to make it more usable. That is good. Some certain suggestions, right. You know, as far as here's the next thing you should do, you certainly can override it, but you know, uh, ways of, of guiding you through the process you know that's one thing that we do find is that there still is a lack of users out there and training is always tricky right uh so yeah. ways to to learn while you're doing something is is it seems like the way that people want to continue to learn they don't want to just sit down in a classroom they want to start playing with it and if they get stuck they can ask for help yeah, so listen, guys, thank you so much, the Autodesk team, especially the Alias uh, development team and the product managers, Barry and Phil. Thank you so much for putting this all together for us. It was great. Uh, like I said, I'm going to put um, the, a link to the recording for everybody who attended for today. And like I said, if you have questions for any of us, whether it's linkage, uh, Barry, um, Phil or others, just go ahead. You'll see their email on, on the list. So thanks guys. Really appreciate it. And uh, once again, thanks all thanks to all of you for, for attending our, our second DDUG. So look for, you know, updates on what's going to happen in December. Great. All right. Thanks everyone. Take thanks, care, friends. everyone. Thank you for your time. Take it easy, everyone. You guys rock. Bye. Thanks so much. Right on. Thank you. Appreciate it.